Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 55, Skylab 2, Part 1, 11 Years in May. Last time on The Space Above Us, a rogue meteoroid shield, a crippled solar array, a space station in peril. Three astronauts think they have what it takes to... <clears throat> Sorry about that. Movie Guy voice has it pretty much right, though. On the last episode, we took a science-minded tour of Skylab, NASA's first space station. We learned about the Earth Resources Experiment Package, the myriad sensors and instruments on the Apollo telescope mount, and even the tiny scientific airlocks on either side of the orbital workshop. After that, we packed it up and stuck it on top of the first two stages of a Saturn V rocket. On board were nearly 100 experiments, 850 bags, 60 music cassette tapes, 420 towels, 74 lights, 4 decks of cards, 840 washcloths, 3 velcro-tipped darts, and the hopes and dreams of countless scientists and engineers. All we had to do was get it into orbit. On the way up, the meteoroid shield decided space wasn't for it, and headed for the ocean, tearing off one solar array and jamming the other in the process. What resulted was a space station that wasn't quite dead, but was in serious trouble. But let's take a step back and pretend we don't know any of this yet. Imagine Skylab gets deposited into its orbit, the meteoroid shield pops out into its normal position, the solar arrays deploy, and everything's going just great. Who would be launching to visit the station the next day? That would be the crew of Skylab 2. Now I know what you're thinking. What happened to Skylab 1? Actually, that was the flight of the space station itself, making the first mission with the crew Skylab 2. Okay, I know what you're thinking again. Hang on, I googled the mission patch for the first crewed mission of Skylab, and it says Skylab 1 on it. Yeah, you're right. It turns out that they sort of went back and forth on this for a while, and in the time between making the mission patches and launching, they changed their minds again. The result is that I will be continuing a fine tradition of spaceflight history enthusiasts and constantly reminding you that Skylab 2 was the first mission with people on board. The people in question were a crew of three, one of which we know very, very well. Commander of Skylab 2 was the one, the only, the Sky King himself, Pete Conrad. Of course, we are well familiar with Pete Conrad's superb piloting skill, unending tenacity, and plucky sense of humor. He flew as pilot on Gemini 5 alongside Gordon Cooper, got his first command on Gemini 11, where he and Dick Gordon flew to record-setting heights, and kicked up dust in the Sea of Storms on Apollo 12, where we saw him last. Conrad would have gladly stuck around for another lunar landing mission, but did the math and realized that chances were he wouldn't get another shot. Instead, he dove headfirst into Skylab, and here he is commanding the first mission. This was his fourth and final flight. A big part of Skylab was studying the reaction of the human body to space. As such, NASA finally decided to fly their first physician astronaut, flying in the role of science pilot, Joe Kerwin. Joseph Kerwin was born on February 19, 1932, in Oak Park, Illinois. He received a bachelor's degree in philosophy from College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, right across town from my and Robert Goddard's alma mater. He went on to study medicine at Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago and the U.S. Navy School of Aviation Medicine in Florida. He joined NASA as part of Astronaut Group 4, the Scientist Astronauts, in 1965, alongside, among others, Harrison Schmidt. This was his first and only flight. Rounding out the crew was pilot Paul Weitz. Paul Weitz was born on July 25, 1932, in Erie, Pennsylvania. Weitz earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering and later a master's in the same subject from the U.S. Navy Postgraduate School. In between those, he served on a destroyer and earned his wings with the Navy, serving in Vietnam. NASA came knocking in 1966, and he became part of Astronaut Group 5, the original 19, where he joined a crowded flight roster. This was his first of two flights. The original mission that Conrad, Kerwin, and Weitz had trained for would have been challenging enough under normal circumstances. Each of those 100 scientific experiments needed to be tended to and properly executed. In between that, the crew needed to perform routine maintenance on both the vehicle and their bodies, all while evaluating a slew of new concepts in spacecraft design. 
Did the Earth style room layout work better, or was the wide open workshop the way to go? Were the efforts put towards industrial design and even color palettes paying off when it came to a long, fruitful, and healthy spaceflight? NASA had never done anything like this before, so there are plenty of open questions. Let's snap back to May 14, 1973. Conrad, Kerwin, and Weitz watched from a few miles away as Skylab roared off into orbit. And it didn't take long for reports of trouble to make their way over to the astronauts. It was soon apparent that they would not be flying to Skylab tomorrow, or maybe ever, so they hopped aboard their jets and headed back to Houston to help do what they could. One thing was clear, they would not be flying the mission they trained for. Skylab had two major problems. The flashiest one was something NASA suspected and that we know for sure. One solar array was torn from the vehicle entirely, and the other was jammed in place by debris and could not open. That was bad. Really bad, actually. But it was workable. The Apollo telescope mount solar panels were working great, keeping the station alive. And once the CSM docked, they would be able to generate extra power using its fuel cells. At least for a few weeks. They would have to run the station in low power mode and do all the experiments that required electricity in the first few weeks of the mission. Then for the last week, they would be down to low or no power activities, like taking photos or drawing blood samples. It wasn't great, but it was doable, at least for the first mission. If they couldn't figure something out, then the twice as long second and third missions could be in real trouble. But as crazy as the image of a bundle of wires where a solar array used to be is, Skylab's real problem was thermal control. The meteoroid shield's main function was, well, to shield against meteoroids, little bits of rock and debris that had the potential to puncture the vehicle. Incidentally, in an ironic little twist, the shield was actually added early in the design process when less was known about the meteoroid situation in low Earth orbit. By the time Skylab flew, they knew they didn't really need it, but it was easier to fly with it in place. And hey, you never know, maybe something would hit them. Oh well. Its secondary function was to help regulate the thermal environment in the workshop. It essentially did this just by using an appropriate paint job that allowed it to reject heat. Nothing super fancy, just super important. With it gone, there was nothing in the way of the harsh direct sunlight that's all the harsher in space. Well, nothing but a big giant gold square that was there to facilitate heat transfer between the shield and the workshop. Fun fact, big giant gold squares are great at soaking up heat. So right away, temperatures began to soar in the spacecraft. It wasn't exactly like it was an oven in there, but we're talking 120-130 degrees Fahrenheit. This is problematic for several reasons. First of all, people obviously aren't going to want to live and work in such a hot structure. They might be able to dip in and out of it, but they wouldn't be able to do serious work in there. Second, the electronics on board were not designed for this. Several gyroscopes used to sense the attitude of the vehicle started to fail, forcing mission controllers to get creative. Want to know Skylab's pitch? Measure the difference in electricity generation between two specific solar panels on the ATM. Want to know the role? Measure the difference in temperature between two sensors on opposite sides of the workshop. Stuff like that. It could work in a pinch, but it wouldn't last forever. Third, there were plenty of temperature-sensitive resources on board the spacecraft. Camera film needed to be within specific temperature and humidity ranges to stay viable. Enough food for all three crews was stashed on board and could start to break down in the high heat. And the entire onboard supply of medication was at risk of deteriorating. NASA checked in with Kodak, food experts, and doctors, and decided the food was fine, most of the medicine was okay, but they'll send some extra, and the film would just be replaced entirely to be safe. But if they couldn't fix the problem, they'd just end up back where they started after a few days. Lastly, the structure of the workshop was never intended to get this hot. Insulating material between the bare metal of the S-4B and the interior of the workshop worked great in the planned temperature ranges, but had the potential to release toxic fumes in high heat. This was a severe enough concern that over the coming days, mission controllers would vent most of Skylab's air several times in hopes of flushing out any fumes that might be present. Just to add insult to injury, while the workshop was practically on fire, other parts of the station were too cold. 
In fact, coolant loops in the airlock module used with the spacesuits threatened to freeze entirely, which could crack the plumbing. What made this all really tricky was that the two problems were tightly coupled. Want more electricity? Point Skylab at the sun. Oh, but wait, that will heat things up. Okay, point away from the sun. Oh, but now we don't have power. While engineers worked to discover a permanent fix, controllers in Houston had no choice but to wing it and try to find a compromise attitude that would provide sufficient electricity without cooking the interior. By the time the Skylab 2 crew landed back in Houston, there was already a massive engineering effort underway. When you imagine the response to Skylab limping into orbit, I want you to think Apollo 13, but bigger. With Apollo 13, it was basically entirely focused on Houston. And even then, it was focused on teams trying to squeeze slightly more performance out of the onboard systems. With Skylab, you had the Johnson Space Center in Houston, previously called the Manned Space Center, and the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville together leading the charge, but with ideas and resources flowing in from all the NASA field centers. There were even ideas from the general public flowing in. And unlike Apollo 13, rather than tweaking systems already in space, they actually had to build something and send it up. Right now. The next opportunity to launch the Skylab 2 crew was in five days. That's how long NASA had to figure out how to fix the problem, fabricate the flight hardware, get the crew trained on it, and get it all onto the rocket. People were working around the clock, sleeping at their desks if they slept at all. Managers walked around asking who needed what. You need food? You need money? You need a plane? One of my favorite little stories to come out of all this was when the thought arose that clearing the debris from the solar array might require similar tools to those used by workers who operate on high-voltage power lines. You'd need various standard tools but operated on a long pole. They found a company that made these, called them up, and basically told the guy to give them everything he had. He said he could ship NASA the gear as soon as possible, but that wasn't good enough. They told him to get to the airport they were sending a plane. Eventually, this guy called home to his wife from several states away, essentially saying that he had been kidnapped by NASA and would be home in a few days. Work centered around finding a couple of different viable strategies that could all fly with the crew in a few days. When it came to the solar array, there just wasn't enough that was known, so until they got a better look at it, the best they could do was include a good kit of tools designed for cutting and manipulating stuff from far away. The thermal problem is where things got really interesting. All they really needed was something with a suitable material placed between Skylab and the sun. It sounds super easy, but keep in mind that no one was supposed to be doing spacewalks in this area. There were no handholds for astronauts or mounts for new equipment. All the work would either have to be done from the structure of the Apollo telescope mount or during a stand-up EVA out of the command and service module. As an analogy, and not really a two-scale analogy since I was too lazy to look up the dimensions for this, but imagine if you had to fix the engines on a 747 while holding onto the outside of the cockpit. Or in the case of a stand-up EVA, fixing the engines from a weird floating cherry picker. One early thought was to basically just use spray paint on the exterior of the workshop. It was simple and would work, but there were concerns about contamination. It wouldn't be great if they somehow got paint on the scientific instruments or somehow glued the solar array shut, so spray paint was out. There were also some ideas related to balloons or other inflatables, but none were workable in the time allowed. Instead, it came down to two finalists, both of which would fly. The runner-up was the two-pole solution that worked sort of like a giant window shade. It'll help if you can look at a picture of Skylab during this, but I'll do my best to paint a word picture. The orbital workshop itself is like a big can, with no handholds or structure outside, except for a messed up solar array. On top of the can is a lattice of structural elements that supported the Apollo telescope mount. With the two-pole solution, two poles would be attached to the same structural element on the ATM and extend towards the bottom of the workshop, making a big isosceles triangle. By placing an eyelet on the end of the poles and using some rope, it would be possible to extend these poles during an EVA and then pull the rope to move a solar shield in place, sort of like a giant window shade. 
This solution was actually considered to be the better long-term solution, but was not preferred for Skylab 2 since it would require a really difficult spacewalk right after arriving at the station. The preferred solution came to be called the Parasol. Remember those little scientific airlocks I made sure to keep mentioning? It turns out that one of them was almost in the center of the area that needed to be shielded. So if engineers could figure out a shielding device that could be shoved through the small airlock, then they would have their solution. And they wouldn't even need an EVA to deploy it. Well, they came up with something. Imagine a super large spring-loaded umbrella that keeps trying to open itself. That's sort of a cop-out analogy since they're already calling it the parasol, but stay with me. Now imagine you stuck the closed umbrella through a small hole in the side of your house. Since this is a big umbrella, it's too long and the base would not clear the hole at first, so you'd need to keep adding more extenders to the handle. Once you extend it enough that the base of the umbrella clears the hole on the other side, the umbrella can pop open. Then, you pull the extender back in towards you, and the open umbrella nestles up against the side of your house. And your neighbors call the police. But luckily, there are no cops in space, because this is exactly the plan with the parasol. It was simple, it didn't require an EVA, and it was good enough to solve the immediate crisis and allow more thought about a long-term solution. It was exactly what they needed. In order to qualify both of these devices, engineers built a number of versions with different materials. Maybe this material works better in the direct sunlight, but it's too thick. This material is thin, but sticky. A precise balance needed to be found. Meanwhile, the Skylab 2 backup crew and prime crew tested different solutions in the neutral buoyancy tank. The tank proved to be a lifesaver because it made it far easier to figure out what would and wouldn't work once in space. While all these tests were being done, they also had to start building the actual flight articles. This is obviously pretty tough when the design is changing hour to hour, but they made it work. The parasol especially was a little tricky since it had to be squished down into a small package that could fit through the scientific airlock. They actually called in specialized seamstresses to fabricate the main shield and Navy SEAL parachute experts to pack it. All of this took time, so after a couple of days, it was decided to abandon the five-day launch opportunity and instead focus on the next chance ten days after the launch of the station. Mission controllers had managed to find a good enough compromise between power and heat that Skylab should survive until then. This also gave the crew a little extra time to familiarize themselves with the new equipment. A few days ago, this stuff didn't even exist, and in less than a week, they would be called upon to deploy it in space. But NASA did what it does best. Given a clear problem with well-defined constraints and an impossible deadline, they rose to the challenge. It meant some sleepless nights and some crazy experiments and moving some flight hardware around the backs of vans, but it was coming together. Someone at Marshall called it the 11 years in May. Panic and despair were replaced with ingenuity and grit. The fixes looked like they would work and the flight hardware was coming together. It was tight, though. So tight that propellant loading was already underway on the Saturn 1B launch vehicle when the parasol and window shade were placed in the command module. As May 25, 1973 dawned and the crew boarded their spacecraft, a different mission faced them than they had expected. But they were up for the task. At 9am, a Saturn 1B lifted off from Launch Complex 39B for the first time, and Conrad, Kerwin, and Whites were on their way with Conrad calling out, Skylab 2, we fix anything. One uneventful ascent and five revolutions later, and the crew of Skylab 2 had arrived at their new home in space. Conrad performed a fly-around so they could get a good look at the vehicle before moving in. Their suspicions were immediately confirmed. Where the second solar array was supposed to be, there was instead just a bunch of wires. Where the meteoroid shield was supposed to be, there was just a big gold square, which had been turning black in the sun. And the first solar array was attached, but still in its protective cover, which seemed to be held in place by a piece of debris, a large aluminum strap. While Houston and Huntsville processed that information, Conrad moved the CSM up to the multiple docking adapter and brought it in for a soft dock. Since it's been a while since we discussed the Apollo docking adapter, 
A soft dock is where the three latches at the end of the probe engage in the drogue on Skylab. After a soft dock, a flip of a switch would retract the probe and pull them in for a hard dock, where 12 latches around the circumference of the docking port engaged. At that point, the probe could be removed and a nice pressurized tunnel remained. The crew still had some work to do outside, so they left the CSM soft docked while they ate their meal and had their first break since the launch. After a short break, Conrad disengaged from Skylab and maneuvered the CSM down near the trapped solar array. It was time for one of the craziest things I've ever heard of in all of human spaceflight. The crew depressurized the CSM and swung open the hatch, with Paul Weitz partially out in space on a stand-up EVA. To help stabilize his position, Joe Kerwin grabbed onto Weitz's leg. With Conrad at the controls, the CSM moved in close to the solar array. Weitz extended a long tool in the hopes of grabbing the debris and slipping it over the solar array cover, freeing the panel inside. As he pulled on it, Conrad had to react and keep the CSM stable, and Skylab itself reacted by firing the nitrogen thrusters it used when the control moment gyros weren't enough. But the debris just wouldn't budge. As Weitz put it, it was as if it had been nailed on. But you really have to visualize this scene. You've got the biggest spacecraft ever flown at that point. Alongside it is the Apollo CSM, a massive spacecraft in its own right. You got Paul Weitz hanging out the door with basically a big stick, yanking on a thing hanging off of a space station with all of his might. Meanwhile, Joe Kerwin is holding onto Weitz's leg just trying to keep him from drifting out the door, though he was tethered, and Pete Conrad is just trying to keep everything from crashing into each other. Everything about this is crazy and amazing. Needless to say, this didn't go on for long. After about a minute of yanking on the debris, Conrad called an end to this risky maneuver, and the crew buttoned up the hatch again. It looked like a more complex EVA to repair the solar array would be required. But with imagery from the astronauts, the backup crew was able to get to work developing a solution in the neutral buoyancy tank. For now, it was time to wrap up a long and arduous day. Conrad moved the CSM back up to the top of the MDA to dock for good. The orbital workshop may be super hot and potentially full of toxic fumes, but the MDA and the airlock should be fine, and there was a door between them and the workshop. Conrad lined up with the docking drogue again, moved in, and... nothing. No soft dock. Hmm. Okay. He backed off and tried again. Nothing. This. This was a problem. Since they were currently out of contact with the ground, they duly worked their way down the checklist of backup procedures and emergency procedures. Nothing was working. If they couldn't dock, then that was it. They could separate from Skylab for the night and return the next day, but the same problem would still be waiting for them. They had to solve this, or the mission would be over. You've really got a feel for these guys. They trained their butts off for a lengthy and complicated mission, and everything goes wrong. They figure out a solution, get up there, and something completely unrelated goes wrong. Eventually, after consulting with Houston, the crew depressurized the CSM once again, removed the docking probe, bypassed some electronics that indicated if there was a soft dock or not, and put it back. Based on what I know of how the docking probe works, I think while they did this, the nose of the spacecraft was just wide open to space, which must have been a pretty freaky visual. With the hacked probe put back in place, Conrad moved in once more. But this time, instead of waiting for soft dock, he just moved right into hard dock and hoped for the best, a la Apollo 14. The banging of all 12 latches slipping into place must have been the sweetest sound the crew had ever heard. Skylab 2 was home. Next time. Well, next time we're going to have a lot on our plate. We'll follow the crew into Skylab itself, and then into the workshop proper. It was absurdly hot in there, but as the late great Private Hudson said, it's a dry heat. We'll learn about the crew's attempts to solve the station's dire thermal problems, and the slightly less dire but still critical power generation problems. And along the way, we'll learn what life aboard Skylab was like. What did the crew do day to day? Did the equipment work as expected? And how did Pete Conrad get addicted to butter cookies while in space? Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>